I would not give you one exactly like this on the exam next week. Because the best way to translate the first statement based upon what we have and haven't gone over might have been a tricky one. Thus, uh, thus de depending on how you translated the first sentence, will determine the rest of your piece. Now indeed, if you translated it in the way I wouldn't have translated it, but you did the rest of the work properly, no foul. Because I didn't, I didn't make that one clear. Now, this one actually is more complicated to do a diagram of, but this one is a lot more clear for translating into standard form. Now, does anyone know why I said that this first one may have been a little bit challenging? Any takers? The question is, do you translate it as all P-R-E or all E-R-P? Everyone who is eligible to take introduction to <laughs> philosophy is a person who is qualified to take English. Well, if you want to get technical about it, it means what? It actually means both of those. It actually means both of those, but depending on which one you used in your syllogism will determine if it's, if it's valid or invalid. Now let me show you how I did it. English 1, 101, are persons who are, uh, who are eligible to take intro to philosophy. Smith isn't eligible to take intro to philosophy. How would you have translated that? Smith is a singular person. We can treat him as a what? A class with one member. So you can translate this as no person who is Smith is a person who is qualified to take intro to philosophy. Therefore, no person who is Smith is qualified to take English 101. Translated this way, it was an AEE2. Do I need to do the diagram of this one? You should probably say no, because you've seen this twice already. You may have seen it three times already. Is this one valid? Yeah, you saw that it was valid via diagram before, but we can show you that it's valid via the rules. We got one negation here, we got one negation here. So it passes the negation rule. Does the middle term distribute? Yes. Yes, and that's as the predicate of an E now our conclusion requires two terms to distribute because our conclusions are what our conclusion is an E so it requires both of them to be distributed and in this case S is the subject of an, e, of an E, and in the premise, it's also the subject of an E. So that distributes. Our uh, in our conclusion, the, uh, Q is the predicate of an E, which distributes. It distributes here as the subject of an A. Now, you'll notice if you had translated this as all P or Q, this would have been what? Yeah, this one would have been invalid. And this is because we would have a term in the conclusion that distributes, that wouldn't distribute up here. So if you translated it as an A, E, E, 
Yeah, thank you. If you translated it as an AEE1, -E you should have concluded that it was invalid. Now, you won't get one that gives you that problem on the test next week. Things will be uh, much clearer than that one. So if you, if you had a problem with that, for, uh, with that one, it might have been on how you translated the first premise. Let's look at the second one. Now this one's actually relatively easy if you can get past all the ones. It's very, very wordy. And this is why in order to handle this one, it helps to get it into forms where we just work with the letters. Let's do this. No student who misunderstands the concept of fallacies. What letter do you want to use? It doesn't matter if you use M, C, or F. Which one do you want to use? No student who misunderstands the concept of fallacies are persons who will pass philosophy 102. Some students who pass philosophy 102 P. Some students who pass Phil 102 are persons who fail to understand syllogisms. Therefore, some students who fail to understand syllogisms are students who do not misunderstand fallacies. That not and misunderstand might have through you because it's very wordy, but it simply translates to this. Because remember, F means uh, misunderstands fallacies. Of course, does not misunderstand fallacy sounds a little bit awkward, but we can perfectly leave it this way. So this one is an E I O 4. And was it valid or was it invalid? For any of you who cheated and looked anything up online, you may have noticed that all EIO syllogisms are valid regardless of mood. How many of you looked that up? I'll understand if you did. But yeah, every EIO syllogism is, is valid. It is the only mood in all figures that is valid. But that's not a reason. In other words, you still either had to do the diagram or use the method. And by the way, folks, when it comes to test time, it will get no what? If you can handle this and you don't make any bookkeeping errors, you ought to be fine. No FRP, like so. Oh, what am I doing? Somebody stop me. I was doing all FRP. Oh, it's going to be pretty. See how easy it is to make a bookkeeping mistake. No FRP. That's better. Some P or S, where am I putting an X? I'm putting it in six, it's the only place it can go. This was some P or S, but it shaded away, that's some P or S. Have we diagrammed some S are not F? Yeah, this X right here in S is indeed an S, and it's not F. So this conclusion can be validly, is validly demonstrated. Now, going through the rules method would not have been all that difficult either. Even though for valid ones, you have to do what? Yeah, you have to go through all three to demonstrate it. That's why the rules method is actually the easiest one to use if what? 
if you immediately recognize that it's invalid, because then all you have to do is go straight to the rule that it breaks. But in this case, it passes the negation rule because our conclusion's a negation and only one of our premises is a negation. Middle term distributes as the predicate of an E. So our middle term distributes. We have one distributed term in the conclusion. O's distribute predicates. And F distributes as subject of an E. Valid by both methods? <coughs> These things are actually quite easy when what? Oh, once you've given them a little bit of practice. Just like pretty much everything. Any questions about that one? Won't get any more difficult than that uh, on, an, on an examination. That's as tough as one of these will get. <clears throat> and if you, if you missed a class, uh, yeah, Castle. Uh, what day next week the Kimmer test will be? I'm just going to hold off until three minutes before the end of class and, uh, make, and, make, a, and make a proposal, and then I was going to talk about voting. Okay. Because, yeah, I was, uh, I was going to do it as a Democrat majority. Because <coughs> the thing is, I'm not in a hurry. I'm not in a hurry. We have time. Just so long as we have this in sometime next week, we'll be fine. And I, I just lied. Uh, I was going to propose it either be next Wednesday or next Friday. So either way, you have a solid week in order to uh, reacclimate yourself. <coughs> that was what I was going to propose. You're out next Friday, is it? Monday, next Monday. Oh. You mean this coming this Monday? This coming Monday, yeah. Oh, okay. So either way, you'll be here. Mm -hmm. All right. We've done this. We've done this. Uh, today, I just want to wrap, I want to tie up some loose ends with, chap with chapter two. Now, do keep in mind, we went into larger detail than the textbook did on categorical syllogisms. We did talk about what other kind of deductive logic already. We already talked about those propositional logic structures. Do not forget those. Just for review, remember hypothetical syllogism, modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism. You should be able to identify them when you see them. So that's review. Now I wanted to talk about a couple of other things that are in the text that I didn't have homework on, but you will want to make sure that you're comfortable with. This likely will not show up on a quiz or test, but I at least want to make sure you are familiar with it. The author talks about one of the styles of what is called a method of indirect proof. Now notice I've showed, shown you guys things that are more like direct proofs. Now the example that the author talks about of a familiar form of, of indirect proof is called reductio ad absurdum. If you had an intro to philosophy class with me in particular, I know you heard me bring this up one time, and then pro probably you didn't hear it again. But, <clears throat> but reductio ad absurdum, put in plain English, means reduction to absurdity. Now the reason why it's a form of indirect proof is because rather than state your conclusion that you're trying to prove, what you do is instead present your 
What you will take as your given or your starting point is your opponent's view. Instead of starting with the proposition that you're trying to prove, instead you will start out with your opponent's view. And then using and then using other premises and deductive inferences And by the way, my opponent's view, let's just call it V. What ends up showing not V. So the last line of your reductio ad absurdum indirect proof will be this. V and not V. And for those of you who don't remember, even though this wasn't in the book, I said that this logical symbol is what we use for and in propositional logic. It's known as the dot. <clears throat> and of course, this symbol in propositional logic is what? This one's and, and this one is not or not the case. Now, what is that statement, V and not V, called? This is an example of, this is an example of what we call contradiction. A contradiction refers to a proposition that is necessarily what? Contradictions are statements that are necessarily false. No matter what you plug in for the truth values of this statement, it will be false. Because remember, when V is true, not V will be false. When V is false, not V will be true. V cannot both be true and not true at the same time. It breaks a famous logical rule discovered by the ancient Greeks. It's sometimes called the law of contradiction. You may also hear the same darn law called the law of non-contradiction. No matter which one you hear it called, they're referring to the same thing. The law of non-contradiction says no thing can be both true and not true in the same time, manner, and place. If something, if a, if, a, if a proposition leads to its own contradiction, there must be something wrong with it. If presupposing V ends up leading to its own contradiction, there must be something wrong with it. Yeah, Hannah. Can you give an example of an I don't know if you want to hear this one. Now, there is a famous one in the history of philosophy. You don't have to know this one for the test. And I know one of you heard this one pretty darn recently. An example of a reductio ad absurdum argument in the history of philosophy Zeno's paradoxes employ this one. The philosophical problem of evil is another example that employs a reductio ad absurdum type argument. This one's probably the easier one to talk about in this context, because this one I'd have to open, what do they call it, a very large bag of snakes in order to set up. So I'll talk about this one. The problem of evil refers to the the starting assumption that God is totally perfect, loving, and good. Now, critics point out that the world that we experience appears to be inconsistent with that proposition. Why? Because there's a whole lot of what in the world? 
a whole lot of suffering of people who don't deserve to suffer. Suffering of the innocent is what it's called. Now, indeed, this argument is a famous one. And neither believers nor unbelievers have a, have a foolproof argument on it. But I will tell you this. The person who uses the problem, or I should say, who argues that the problem of evil cannot be reconciled, they argue that the believer says God is good, but the evidence says God is not good. God cannot be both good and not good simultaneously. So there's something wrong with the believer's argument. And this is, of course, why the believer comes up with methods to try, to try to explain the problem away, or to use the nicer word, to reconcile it. And most believers have some kind of reconciliation. If you don't, it means you're probably not thinking very much. And by the way, if you're going to hold a belief, you darn well should think about it. Because what do they say about the unexamined life? Oh, that dude Socrates once said that the unexamined life is not worth, yeah, it's not worth living. Does that help, I hope? Mm -hmm. Good, good. Now, just enough time to wrap up the last two things from chapter two I wanted to talk about. Now, what I just discussed is actually a nice little segue into this, this next part. Now, the author talks about, remember when we talk about propositions or statements? Propositions can take one of three different forms in terms of overall truth value. The first one I just showed to you a contradiction. Contradictory claims are necessarily false, and they will always be able to be boiled down to the structure P and not P. A statement may also be a tautology. Tautologies are necessarily what? Tautologies refer to statements that are necessarily true. Every tautology will be able to be boiled down to this. P or not P. Because you'll notice every time P is true, not P will be false, but the total or statement will still be what? it will still be true because an or, you only require one side of it to be true for the whole statement to be true. The last kind of statements are called contingent statements. You may also hear me call, me call them contingencies. Contingent statements are true or false depending upon what? Contingent statements will be true or false depending on, upon the truth value of the content. Now, which one of these three do you think is the most common among statements? contingent statements. Almost all of the logical statements that you will see used will require us to determine the likely truth value of the content to determine if the total statement is true or not. Now, statement. 
This contingent statement happens to be what? <coughs> this one happens to be false. Because Obama is no longer the president, and Mr. Smith is not the president. If both sides of the or are false, the total statement is false. By the way, this was an oblique reference to the famous movie, Mr. Smith, starring Jimmy Stewart. Is that before most of your time, I take it? Anyway, that's an example of a contingent statement. Now, it's easier for me, for time's sake, to demonstrate without using actual words. This is also a contingent statement. P and Q, or R. Now notice, it is irrelevant what P, Q, and R stand for. Because if I plug in various truth values for these, we can determine if the total statement is true. Now in order for this total statement to be true, what conditions would have to be met? And some of you might be getting minor bad flashbacks. How many of you did truth tables? in a math class. Do I see any hands? We are not doing truth tables here, so don't, don't worry about it. Now, if you found them easy, you might be pissed at me for saying that. But yeah, this is, this is kind of like what goes on if you did a truth table. Remember, you plug in conditions under which the, you know, the, you, know you give these truth values to the various letters, and then you see whether or not the total statement is true or false. Now you'll notice that this statement will be true no matter what these are as long as R is true. Because you only need one side of the, the OR to be true in order for the whole statement to be true. So if you know that R is true, it's irrelevant if, whether P, P and Q are true or not. Now if R is false, then in order to make this statement true, what has to also be true? P and Q. P and Q, because an and is only true if both sides are true. So yeah, this is an example of a contingent statement. Now folks, you won't have to do much work with this because we uh, we won't be doing anything deeper in propositional logic than we've already done. Now, before you go, do make sure you take a look at that last little bit in chapter two, where the author talks about some misconceptions about induction and deduction. I do want to say a few more words about induction on Wednesday before we move on. Now, folks, I just might have a last review quiz to give you one last chance of redemption first thing on Wednesday. And by the way, you shouldn't mind it. Why? Take it as another opportunity to get yourself right for the exam next week. Now first, uh, right after the quiz on Wednesday, the quiz is already made up, so I just have to print it. But, uh, <clears throat> But uh, I was proposing that we take the 100-point exam on chapters 1 and 2 either next Wednesday or next Friday. If you take it Wednesday, I will have them for return on at Friday's class, guaranteed. But yeah, we, we would take the exam for the entire class. No written homework for 